Hello, I'm Harrison Perkins. I'm the Assistant Minister at London City Presbyterian Church, and this is our uh, effort to help keep observing the Lord's Day in our interesting situations. Uh, as you can tell, not at uh, our meeting house for London City Presbyterian Church, as we might say, uh, and we're trying to provide this way of worshiping. Uh, I'm glad that you've tuned in. Uh, I'm glad that you're watching this. I hope it'll be useful. We're praying that this comes together well and that you can gather and, and watch this uh, to help you worship God as your family and your houses and that sort of thing. We begin our services, and so I'm going to start this time with a, a call to worship. And today I'm going to read from uh, Revelation chapter 21. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. God's people are reminded that when God is with us, we have no reason to fear that God will take away our worries and concerns. And we think about that together today. Uh, and we're going to respond, though, now to that call to worship by singing our, our first item of praise from Psalm 24. We're going to sing the first six verses. And even though I know this is unusual circumstances, I'm going to exhort you, do your best to sing uh, God's people from LCPC are going to be singing at the same time together this psalm, and we're going to sing these first six verses uh, that begin, The world and all in it are God's, all the peoples of the earth, for it was founded by the Lord upon the seas beneath. Psalm 24, singing the first six verses. Let's praise God together. to God, having been summoned into his presence, we uh, should turn to him in prayer, uh, bringing our needs to him, but also asking him to help us as we do try to worship him and, and keep his day best we can uh, in this time we might have together. So bow with me in prayer. Father God, we are immensely aware of, of the great many concerns on people's hearts right now. We know that it is difficult to imagine how we might remove those. Uh, but God, we are praying, we are seeking you that you would alleviate the, the burdens that people feel right now. As we've already thought about how when you come to dwell among your people uh, and your dwelling pit places with man, tears will be wiped away. Mourning will disappear. Your people will rejoice. And God, we pray that as we do our best to keep your day, uh, that you would help us to be reminded well of that, that we would rejoice 
that you have made your dwelling place with us, your people, that you have longed to have us, and that is why we have this thing called the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has redeemed sinners, that you have made people who were your enemies into your treasures. You have adopted us as your family, and we are grateful. We give you praise that you dwell with us. And we give you praise for the great lengths that you've gone uh, to in Christ in order to accomplish that. And we come and we confess uh, how worried we can be in this day and age when the threat of disease, but perhaps even more so the, the threat of disruption in society, is always pressing against us. It is easy for us to be concerned. But God, we cry out to you and ask that you would help us, that you would be with us and, and do good to us, uh, that you would come alongside us, that you would remove these fears. Forgive us, Lord. We know that it is easy for us to place our trust in our comforts, in the things that we can achieve. And it is very clear to us right now that there's very little, if anything, we can do to achieve new measures of comfort, to attain the things that we had before. And so, Lord, we are convicted by the fact that all of this has revealed how much we trusted in other things. And we confess that to you and we repent. And we ask that you would forgive us because of Christ. But having confessed our sins to you and, and run to you in Jesus, we trust that you will receive us because of him. And because of that, we bring our needs before you as well. Lord God, we pray uh, for our world. We pray that you would eradicate this virus that, that is causing your people even to worship around computers then gathered together. Uh, as, as a body. We pray that you would do that to reunite churches, that we might be able to keep your day as we have so long done and as you've commanded us to do when we gather together. And God, we do pray for your help in that, that you would alleviate these uh, causes that are keeping us apart. Lord, we also pray for the most vulnerable God, we, we know that there are people even in our congregation, we worry about them if they were to contract this virus. And Lord, we just pray that you would protect them. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort the families of people who have already lost loved ones. God, there's no uh, way that we can really imagine what it's like to lose someone to something that we did not even know was going to come to us even a month ago, perhaps. And so we pray that you would honor your promise to be the God of all comfort if your people have lost their loved ones to this. And we pray that you would come alongside us, that you would grant us peace. And we are praying for that. As we heard preached to us last week, that if we come to you by prayer and supplication, that you will fill our hearts with a peace that surpasses all understanding. And we pray that you would do that as we pray to you. We pray for our medical workers, the ones specifically in our congregation even, that you would uphold them, that you would give them energy, that you would maintain their health, protect them from illness. God, we pray for our members. Uh, we pray not only for health, God, we do cry out to you for health. But Lord, we also pray for your provision. Lord, uh, this is a new and sometimes frightening period of, of the world. And we do just seek your face for your provision. We pray that you would keep the families of our congregation and the families of your church around the globe in provision, that you would give them food, that you would make sure they have what they need to eat, that you would make sure that they have the household goods that they need to keep going. We pray that we would be wise in the way that we do eat and use goods. But Lord, we pray that you would keep us uh, well provided for, that you would be good to us in that way. We are seeking your face in that. And we also think about work. Lord, we know that people have even already lost their jobs. We have friends, uh, if not family, 
who have lost work. And God, we pray that you would find ways to uphold your people through this, even if they have lost work. God, we pray for comfort and we pray for provision. We pray that they would be able to find new work as as soon as possible and that you would be bringing this disease to an end, uh, at least its global ramifications, so that your people might have gainful means, that they might be uh, meaningfully employed. We seek your face for that, Lord. We seek your face in provision because we need it. We know that this is a time when things are tight and difficult, and Lord, we pray uh, that you would be alongside those who belong to you to care for them, to be all-sufficient in all things. And Lord, we are seeking you uh, to make use of this catastrophe for your glory. Lord, we long to see gospel good happen. Lord, we are eager to see your name magnified because of this. And so we cry out to you, Lord, would you use this to bring people to Christ? We pray that uh, these efforts we have at online services, Lord, would you use that to grow your people? Yes, Lord, we're asking for sanctification. As we can't meet together, help this means of distributing your means of grace. Help it to be useful. Help it to have fruit. But God, also make people watch even this. Make people watch and listen to sermons all over the world that they might become Christians. God, we don't pray superficially, but we ask for genuine revival, that people around the world would become Christians. We ask that you would do this, that you might be honored, that your people might be built up, that good might come of this. We're seeking your face. Lord, we do trust you. We give ourselves into your hands. And we just ask that you would help us. Give us comfort. Give us peace. Build us up and sustain us. And we ask these things for the sake of Christ. Amen. So our scripture readings today come from John chapter 1. We're going to read the first 18 verses. And then our sermon text will be Psalm 24. So I'm now going to read from John chapter 1, reading the first 18 verses, and then we'll turn to Psalm 24. Hear the reading of God's Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who's at the Father's side. He has made him known. Psalm 24, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it 
upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. We do give thanks for it. We're glad that we can read scripture even in this way. And now, before we turn to consider this passage of scripture from Psalm 24, let's pray together for God to illumine his word. Father God, we do come to your scripture, and right now we all need your comfort. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us now, that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word, even in these unusual circumstances. We ask that you would use this for the benefit of your people. We ask that you would save those who do not know you who may be listening to this. We ask that the times now when we realize our frailty, when we realize how our comforts will not be the shelter we need, we ask God that you would show unbelievers the value of Christ and the salvation that might be had in him. But God, we pray that you would build up your people and remind us that as you dwell among us, we can have peace. We can have hope when our God dwells among us. God, we do pray that you would overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. We ask that you would bless your word that it would go forth in power, that you would use it for your glory, for our benefit. And we do pray these things in the, sake, in, the, in the name and for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I imagine many Christians are, are worried right now and, and even wondering where God is. If he's not with us, then when will he appear? Psalm 24 is about God coming among his people. It is a reminder, even in this time, that God will not abandon us. It presents God's full presence with his people in, in multifaceted ways. Psalm 24 is, is about seeking God and waiting his arrival among his people. It is about recognizing God's greatness and, and desiring that to be near to us. The question before us is whether or not we have to wait for God's presence. I hope that Psalm 24 will help us see that even though there, there is a sense in, in which we do still wait for God to arrive to be with his people, there is another sense in which we have no need to wonder if he will do so, because he already has. Now, before we, we jump in to the text of, of Psalm 24, I want to give you a quick outline of it. In, in verses 1 to 2, we see that David exclaimed praise to God for being sovereign over the world. This is the, the first motion of giving God praise in worship, and then in verses 3 to 6, we see David raise the issue of who can approach God in worship. We see movement from praising God to wondering how we can approach him. Then lastly, in verses 7 to 10, the call to prepare for God to enter among his people. Now, maybe it seemed odd 
in our present moment to think about this psalm that is so much about God's presence among his people. But the reason that it is so important for Christians to understand that, even in our most worried times, that God indeed is with us. The main point that I want to consider today is Christians should maintain good hope because our God is always with us. Christians should maintain good hope because our God is always with us. I want to explore this main idea that the promise of God's presence grants us hope by thinking about four perspectives on God's presence among his people. And so the first one is that God did enter among his people. And so this point considers Psalm 24 in its historical context. What did David mean as he wrote this? Scholars think that, that David wrote it about the event of bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. We know that the Ark was, was the box that, that kept the tablets on which God had written the law. We also know that this box symbolized God's presence, God's throne, which means it, it was an important thing to have in the people's midst. Now, second Samuel 6 tells about the events when David, King David, had the ark brought into the city. And because that ark symbolized God's presence, you can see why that would be an important enough event for David to celebrate by writing this psalm. You know, appropriately, David began with praise that the whole earth belongs to God. Look at verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. David meant that everything in and everyone on the earth belonged to God. We might run quickly past that sometimes, but isn't it a really important point for Christians to remember right now? Countless people are worried about coronavirus, but we must remember it is not as if God is surprised by any of this. God owns the world, after all, and everything in it. To state what may not be obvious, that includes even the tiniest molecules of RNA viruses. But what an amazing thing to consider. These molecules that are filling our world with fear all have to bow their metaphorical knees to the living God. If God willed, he could blast them all out of existence. And since we, his people, also belong to God and he cares richly for us, we know that God has good reason if he lets this situation remain. We will come back to that, but still we have to note now that we too belong to him. He will keep us, as he always has. And the, the next verse of this psalm confirms that point by, by telling us why we know that God rules everything. So verse 2 says, For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Some people make uh, an issue out of the, the science of the statement, as if David believed that the entire earth floated on a cosmic sea of some sort. But, but that ignores the symbolism of poetic portions of Scripture. For Israelites, the sea represented chaos and fear. And the point here, far aside from any scientific notions, is, is that the earth beneath your feet is stable, 
But God is the one who made it stable despite all the underlying reasons why it could be full of chaos and fear. God founded the earth upon the sea. God overcame chaos and fear to give his people a stable place to live. This too is a majestic truth for today. God is the one who, who can bring stability and peace, even though things may be chaotic. If he can do that on the cosmic scale, he can certainly do it for our health and economy. Like Reverend Pearson said last week, we should set aside our anxiety because we have access to God in prayer. If we fear, remember that our God is that God who can do such amazing things, and we can go to him in prayer and supplication. Now, verses 3 to 6 raise some questions. Who actually can approach this majestic God? If he is so marvelous, then how can we enter his presence to receive blessing? David said that the one who is clean and pure, the righteous one, can, can expect blessing from God. We'll come back to that too, but suffice it to say now that David did say that God's people are like that. Look at verse 6. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Maybe you don't feel like that describes you in some ways, but we'll get to that too. The last section, though, verses 7 to 10, tells us that this psalm is about God entering his city. That's why we talk about this being about the ark coming into Jerusalem. David called for the gates to open so that God, the, the King of glory, may enter. God was approaching where his people dwell, and they should be ready to receive him. That, too, is an amazing promise because it reminds us that God draws near to his people. He comes to be among us. David knew that God did enter among his people when the ark came into Jerusalem. God put his presence among his people. That event reassured them that he can dwell with us. We need to think more widely, though, because we know that we don't have the Ark of the Covenant, we don't live in Jerusalem, and we need more, or at least different, assurance than just this psalm's historical horizon. So, so we're also going to think about our, our second perspective. God has entered among his people. Now, this, this psalm points us to another horizon of how God dwells among his people. God entered among his people in the singular event of allowing David to, to bring the ark into the city, but this text also points us to how God has entered among his people in a way that leaves lasting effects. It points us to the promise of Christ. We read John 1, 1 to 18 together, which I hope you recognized as being about the, the incarnation of God's eternal Son. The Word, who was and is God, was sent and became flesh and dwelt among us. And there are all sorts of things that we could pull from verse 14, where I want to focus, since it is such a rich verse all on its own. But I want to think about how it takes us back to the celebration in Psalm 24, 7 to 10, of how the King of Glory was entering. Did you notice how emphatic our psalm was about God being the King of Glory and how that King was coming to his people? Well, John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, 
glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God's eternal Son has God's glory, as it is described in Psalm 24. Jesus is the King of glory. If you have been wondering how a psalm about David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem relates to you, the answer is in John 1. That psalm pointed forward to a greater coming of the King of glory. God the Son, the King of glory, would come in human, did come in human nature, that he might be among his people to save them. So I want to address any non-Christians that might be listening right now. God's people can celebrate that the King of glory has come because we belong to him. But the King of glory, whom Psalm 24, 8 says is strong and mighty, the Lord is mighty in battle, isn't a joyful presence if you don't trust in Christ. Because as the Lord goes into his battle, you are his enemy. You see, Jesus came because we are sinners. He did not come because we are scared or because we are simply broken. He came because we have rebelled against the King of glory. Psalm 24, 3-6 told us that to be able to stand in God's presence, to receive blessings from the King when he arrives, we must be pure in heart, have clean hands, and have a soul free of deceit and falsity. We know that doesn't describe us. The fear that grips our society because of disease and disruption should pale next to the fear of when God comes to judge sinners. Christ, though, came to be the one who has fully clean hands. He lived the entirely righteous life. He had that completely pure heart in all that he did. He's the one who earned that blessing from God of Psalm 24, 5. But Jesus Christ earned that from God so that he could give it to believers. We stand righteous and blessed in God's presence because of Jesus Christ, the King of glory, who gave up his glory so that he might take us to glory one day. If you are an unbeliever, then now is the time to turn to Christ and receive him by faith for rescue. Now is the time to change from being one against whom God will go out in battle, strong and mighty, to being one who is among God's people. And God will dwell with you if you would trust in Christ. And it is true, as verse 6 said, that God's people will be like the one who can receive blessing. But not because we can do it on our own, but because Jesus Christ, who has forgiven all of our sins, will help us. Jesus' presence among his people as God, who has entered among his people, does not remain forever in this state where we are without the concrete sight of God in our midst, though, which is why we want to think about our third perspective from Psalm 24 about God's presence, that God will enter among his people. So Christians know that Jesus will return one day to bring history to a close. If you're a Christian, then, we look to the future in hope that the King of glory will come to enter among his people in fullness. All the fears that leave pockmarks on this age will disappear at Christ's coming. 
It is a joyful event, and we should lift up our heads in expectation of our king's return. Now, verse 7 has special meaning for me when it says, lift up your heads. All right, so when I ministered in Northern Ireland, when I led services, I, I always did a call to confession where I, I briefly explained how a passage of Scripture demands repentance. And after a, a prayer of confession, like we do at LCPC, I read an assurance from 1 John 1, 9 that our sins are pardoned. But I always introduced that verse to assure people by, by saying, Christians, lift up your heads, for the news is good. Now, I thought that people probably took no note of that. But one teenager told me uh, at one point that at least the young people loved it. She told me that she always looked forward to hearing that phrase and said to me, I should lift up my head because the news is actually good. I still get messages from, from people there about how much that phrase, Christians lift up your heads for the news is good, means to them. And they long to hear that because they want to be reassured. My point, though, to you, Christian, is that you should lift up your head. When we are sad, worried, and, and burdened, our, our heads tend to droop. To, to hang, to, to fall. Christian, you have every reason to lift up your head. The king of glory has entered. Look to the future. The king of glory will come to be among his people again. Hold your head high. Your king is coming. And he loves you. He will fill this world with his glory and show his loving majesty in its entirety to you. There is certainly hope grounded in, in the past of what God has done and, and looking to the future, but we can also speak about hope for the present. We, we have seen that God did enter among his people, when the ark came into Jerusalem, we saw that God has entered among his people when God the Son came in Christ. And we have seen that God will enter among his people at Christ's return. But now I want to focus on why we can have hope in this present moment now. And so the last perspective that we're going to think about is that God does enter among his people. I know that we're scattered across all of London and, and maybe further, but we should trust that God will be with us in this time. We still keep best we can in observance of the Lord's day, even though we cannot worship together physically. And we know that even where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, He's present with us. So we do need to know that God comes to us even now. We can pray. We can worship. And Christ will be with us. Beyond that, we can really hope that God will show up and do big things even in what we now experience. Some are, are speculating that God is judging the world's sinfulness in this virus. I, I don't like reading providence like that to discern God's reasons for why this might happen. I think it's not wise, and we don't really know. But from my perspective, what if God, is teaching his people about how powerful his gospel is. What if God is showing us that he doesn't need 
trendy preachers in skinny jeans, and he does not need cool music in the dark to save the lost, like we have so frequently been told that he needs. God may start a genuine revival around the world when pastors can't even leave their homes. And we just have the simple gospel message through an incredibly unideal means of communicating it. We've thought, even as we've studied 1 Corinthians, about how Paul emphasized the word of the cross is the power for our salvation and that God doesn't need anything besides that. And what if God is going to use that gospel in even the ways we can distribute it now to do amazing things? What if we pray for that, LCPC? What, what if we look forward to God doing something amazing through the gospel, even in crisis? What if we trust that God will enter among his people and be really good to us? We can be assured of that. Psalm 24 tells us, reminds us about God coming to his people. Jesus Christ came because God wants to dwell among his people. And we can be assured by everything that Christ has done for us that God is committed to being among and being good to his people. So let's pray. Father God, we know that we live in such an uncertain time. We know that things can easily make us fearful. We know that things can overwhelm us. But God, we pray that we would be people full of hope that we would be people who lean hard on the promises about Jesus Christ, that we would be people who never give up trusting. We would be people who run to you in prayer, who run to you in prayer for big and amazing things. God, we know that even in places where people can't leave their homes around the world, that people are downloading lots and lots of sermons. 500 sermon downloads in Milan over the last, each week over the last few weeks. God, that's an amazing thing. We don't want superficial appearances of revival, but God, we are begging you to start a gospel, a genuine gospel revolution on this planet. God, even in our city, we pray that you would even use us in the very small means we have right now to proclaim the gospel. We're looking for people to come to believe in Jesus. We want that to happen. And we ask that you would do that for the sake of Christ's glory, that more people would be worshiping him, that your name would be magnified as people trust in the Savior. And God, glorify yourself also by giving your people hope. When so many people in this world are without it, God, we pray that you would make us people full of hope. And we pray that you would fill our hearts so full of joy in Christ that we would lift up our heads, that we would rejoice, because the news is good. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of Christ. Amen. We are going to come towards the end of our worship now, singing together to God's praise again. We're going to sing the remainder of the psalm that we've considered. So we're going to sing from Psalm 24. We're going to sing beginning at verse 7. So the words will appear on your screen. We'll have some tunes come through. I would exhort you to do your best in our situation to sing praise to God together. Beginning at verse 7, you ancient gates, lift up your heads. You doors, be opened wide. So may the King of glory come forever to abide. Psalm 24, beginning at verse 7. Let's sing praise to God together.
The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen.